I am speaking with Dr. John Demartini, who is an international speaker, author. He's a, the world's leading, foremost thinker on human behavior. Tell us a little bit about the heart of your work. I mean, I know you travel the world, um, you speak, you're, you don't sit still. Uh, you've you've uh, studied for many, many years and you've really applied your wisdom in a really creative way. What do you do uh, when you're traveling around the world? I research every day, I write every day, I travel most every day, and I teach. And I teach one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes individuals, sometimes one-on groups and workshops, sometimes in seminars, and sometimes in giant rallies where thousands of people are. But I love sharing ideas that I find help inspire people to live magnificent lives. And growing up, you had a learning disability. You've gone on to become this a genius in many, many fields. Did that have anything to do with your trajectory? I definitely had challenges when I was young, and I didn't really learn to read and overcome my learning problems until I was 18. And But from that point on, I was such a, had such a thirst to want to learn and share I was 17 when I, I nearly died, and I met this amazing teacher who inspired me to do what I'm doing today. And he's the one that helped me believe I could overcome my learning problems. I'm going to pause, and I'm actually going to read uh, The Heart of Love. Okay, an excerpt from your book. Every soul sings the song of love. You were created for this feeling which neither begins nor ends but simply is. Love shows no partiality and is its own reward. It can't be possessed, nor does it possess. It withholds nothing, and with it there's no limit. Anything other than this is illusion. To understand true love is to embrace all. Every weekend, I assist people in attaining that state and having them break through the distorted perceptions that they've accumulated in their relationship and help them come to a point where they just have tears of gratitude for the person that they're with and they can look in the mirror and feel that way for themselves. It's really a moment that's really liberating. And when all of a sudden you get to that point, all of the trivia, the, the trivial pursuits that have been going on all of a sudden melt away and there's just nothing there except thank you. And I always say that if you had only 24 hours to live, you'd go to the people who've contributed your life and say, thank you, I love you. I think that's the essence behind our real existence. And it's attempting to reveal itself through a yearning inside us at all times but we suppress it many times with our judgments. Probably the most important thing I've learned from you over the years is, uh, thank you, I love you, is the highest prayer. Well, many people are, are creating, you could say anthropomorphic gods in their own image based on their own values and assuming that, that the entire uh, divine nature is supposed to abide by that individual value system and trying to impose it like a flea telling the dog what to do. And then praying to, for the God, this anthropomorphic deity that they've made up, um, to take care of all the things that challenge them so they can live in this fantasy life. And I always say that the, that's not really the wisest approach to it. Wiser to, to look at what's there, find out how it's serving you in the way it is, as it is, and then come to a state of gratitude for the way it is as it is. The magnificence of the way the world is is far greater than the fantasies we keep imposing on it. Are you spiritual or religious? Are you religious or spiritual? Um, is there a distinction for you? I like to think of a person when they're doing, when they're living in alignment with what they value most, what inspires them spontaneously, like an intrinsic value. Uh, they're so inspired they can't wait to get up in the morning and do what they do. That's the way I feel about what I'm doing in teaching and researching. And that is an inspired path. And that's spiritual to that individual. So if you're, you're, I met a gentleman who climbed Mount Everest four times and climbed the seven top peaks twice each. He's an adventurist. His inspiration, his spiritual life is that. I, I know other people that are dedicated in India that are basically just taking care of people, kind of like a Mother Teresa type, that, that just take care of people. And that's their spirituality. Others that are more traditional and conventional, they go to a religious uh, institution of some form. I don't want to limit spirituality to any form. And I don't think really that anybody's more or less spiritual than anybody else. I think what really is that if you find out what it is that's meaningful to you and what's highest on your value and pursue it, and you give yourself permission to delegate everything else away and go after what's really meaningful. When you do, you feel inspired and you're grateful for life. In your mind, in your work, in your experience, how would you describe God 
um, Aristotle described God as the unmoving mover. But what does that really mean? In really, really prehistoric times, there appears to be inside the human an anxiety or fear from many aspects of nature. The first forms of deities were geomorphic. They worshipped rocks and temples and sacred stones and caves and things of this nature. Then came what they call zoomorphic um, forms of deities, where they were plant-based or animal-based. You see still images, even in Egypt and other parts of the world, where you have part animal gods. Um, you find this in the Mayan culture, etc. And they used to have plant gods. They considered the Soma plant or the Hiawaska plant, and these things were the ways to connect to the gods. We were then later frightened by man, so we moved into anthropomorphic gods. There's an area in the temporal lobe, in the parietal lobe also, that when stimulated by tr transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, can elicit responses that people are feeling that they're connecting to the god and actually having it. And they found out that when we're under fear or feeling oppressed or feeling challenged, that area of the brain lights up. And in order to compensate for that fear, to protect ourselves, particularly in freeze responses, we don't feel like we can fight or flight. Um, we dissociate from the experience, the fear, and go in and create an anti-particle, kind of an anti-perspective that we will identify as a godly experience to protect us from the things that we're frightened of. So it looks like in order to survive the, the experiences of nature, as we went along from our kind of mythological stage into reason, we had to create the deities in order to survive our phobias. As Max Planck and Albert Einstein and others believed that there may be a higher intelligence that's governing the laws of the universe that supersedes those that is actually involved in the, the laws of nature that's given birth to the formation of the planet and formation of the stars and formation of things that supersedes our understanding at this point that we keep solving the mysteries of slowly but surely that we eventually honor as a real intelligence in the universe that's not personified necessarily. It's an impersonal intelligence, but it, it definitely governs all of the physics uh, that run our life. I'd rather believe in that. I'm more focused on that because the other ones we can see are phobic based, but I'd rather see and appreciate that intelligence that's running it. If you took all the Nobel Prize winners uh, together and Professor Meredith together in biology today, they still couldn't put together a single cell. But yet 4.1 years, billion years ago, there was a single cell on the planet. So we have to humble ourselves to the intelligence of there before even humans, who are supposedly the most intelligent creatures on the planet, even came about. Nature doesn't throw away old mechanisms, it builds new layers on top. And so we have to transcend um, the, the, more, the basic layers for more advanced layers as we have reason overriding emotion and impulses and instincts. So we grow as we, as we do. We solve mysteries and go on to the next mystery, and there's no end to that. Are people who are really um, engaged in religion, I mean, is that empowering or is it disempowering or is it both? We have some people that are very fundamental, very black and white, very absolutist, that are very right and wrong, good and bad, infatuation, resentment, and very polarized, and are basically run by tradition and conventional distorted viewpoints, and um, are very caught in a dogma. And you got others that are very awakened and very uh, universal in their perspective, and they are able to have resilience and adaptability in and, and a gray perspective, not a black and white perspective. And they honor, honor people and love people for who they are. So I don't know if any religion necessarily has to impede the evolution of human consciousness. It can actually be part of the path. But I've seen some that use the religion as a, a stumbling block instead of a stepping stone. So I can't say that any religion has got the answer to it because they all have something to contribute. I like to think of it as... Imagine that there was this vast mirror at one time on the planet and that reflected the great truths. And somehow a vandal came and, and uh, vandalized it and, and broke it and it took pieces and everybody grabbed pieces and it splintered it across the world. And everybody on the world has a, a little piece of that great mirror. Our job is to find out how each of those religions have something to contribute and try to find the common thread to them. And there is a common thread to them. And I think it goes down to loving people and being loved, and, and giving true uh, contribution to life by living authentically according to what you value most. Well, society needs complementary opposite value systems, 
building and destroying each other to adapt. This conflict is necessary for the friction to innovate creative ideas to advance us forward in life. For anyone who is watching, uh, one thing, exercise they can do at home, something that they can do to move their life forward, what piece of advice would that be? I would have them go to my website, drdmartini.com, yeah. and actually have them fill out the value determination process. It's a 13-step little questionnaire. It takes about 30 minutes of their time to determine what they value most. And then I would have them attempt to prioritize their life in such a way that they're filling their day with the highest priority actions that inspire them. If people will fill their day with high priority actions that inspire them, it won't fill up with low priority distractions that don't. If they fill their lives with challenges that inspire them, it won't fill up with challenges that don't. And if they bring order to their life by living by priority, it won't keep attracting disorder and allows them to dispire. John, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. I'm very inspired more than ever, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you.